I think it would certainly be appropriate if we asked all of our veterans to stand, if you have served or are serving uh, our country, have served in the past. Would you just stand to your feet? We just want to say thank you. And you never want to take your service for granted. Thank you so much for your sacrifices and your investment. Thank you. You know, this past week, as you undoubtedly know, people all across America celebrated Independence Day. We celebrated in different ways, many of us with barbecues, parties, musical extravaganza, huge firework celebrations. But with all of the celebration, we sometimes, I believe, forget precisely what we are celebrating. The truth is, Independence Day is about freedom. And there's so many amazing symbols of freedom that come to my mind as I think about our country especially this Independence Week as we come to a close. You know, the Liberty Bell, the Statue of Liberty, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, uh, the Declaration of Independence, all of those are powerful images of the freedom we enjoy and often take for granted as Americans. You know, we use the word freedom quite a bit in this country, but I think very few today truly, fully understand its implications. So today I want to talk about freedom. I want to talk about freedom just briefly from a political perspective, but more importantly from a spiritual and a moral perspective. Did you know the Bible has a lot to say about freedom? Matter of fact, it, it uses that expression over and over again many times throughout Scripture. In the book of 1 Corinthians that we've been doing a verse-by-verse -verse study in, the verse I'd like for us to look at today to set the theme of what we're going to talk about, and that is freedom isn't free, it says this. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 says, I am free, but I don't belong to anyone. But I have made the choice... To make myself, I have the freedom to do that, but I've made the choice to make myself a slave to everyone as a Christian because I'm more concerned about winning as many people to Christ as I possibly can, even if that means me giving up my freedom. You know, the concept of freedom is very significant. What does, what does it imply? Let me share with you a couple things that doesn't apply. First of all, freedom isn't license. Freedom doesn't mean that you get to do whatever you want to do without any consequence. You often, you know, we want freedom, but we don't want the consequence or the responsibility or the benefits that sometimes go along with that. We want the benefits, but not, the, not in the negative sense. For example, we as adults, you know, we certainly want the freedom of a quality life that offers such things as in America that we enjoy that other countries don't. Pure drinking water, safe food, good roads, very little crime, depending on what city you live in. <laughs> but we don't often want the responsibility or we suddenly struggle with the responsibility of paying taxes, but that's... It's what enables many of these blessings. You know, citizens of our nation want the right of free elections, yet many don't bother to register or to even walk across the street to vote. You know, freedom isn't a license. Freedom isn't free. Uh, it comes with a price. And, you know, when you get in politics, you suddenly un begin to understand that. By uh, Gabby, are you here today again? It's good to have you here. Would you mind standing? This is Gabrielle Morinci, Judge Morinci. Thank you so much for your service to our community. Thank you so much. She was the first black lady to serve on the bench in Osceola County, and we thank you for your service. And she's running for re-election, and I love when godly, fear people, fear God-honoring uh, people serve God and give their time and efforts, and so we want to be praying for you in your upcoming uh, re-election. But uh, 
Freedom isn't just doing whatever you want to do. It's not just a license. The other thing about freedom, not only is it not a license, freedom isn't free. It has a cost. Uh, it's bought with a price. Certainly the freedom that we just saw in that video, uh, you know, the, the liberty that we have to worship whoever we choose, to think, to write, to say whatever we like are all freedoms that were paid for by the very lives and blood of patriots and lovers of freedom going all the way back to the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the war in Iraq and all the other conflicts that we've had. We enjoy liberty and freedom today because yesterday men and women were willing to sacrifice and pay a price. If freedom isn't free. Another thing that I believe freedom implies is that freedom demands responsible choices. Matter of fact, the freedom that we enjoy or don't enjoy in our life is basically the results of all the choices that we have made and choices that we will make in our future. Choices have consequences. And, and you know, we celebrate freedom as Americans because our ancestors who were patriots, were willing to pay a price. And we realize that political freedom isn't free, but neither is any other kind of freedom. So I want to talk a little bit more today about spiritual and moral freedom. Freedom demands making the right choices, responsible choices. And there is a man in the Old Testament that I want to talk a little bit about today. And it's so good to have all of our young people there because I, I really hope that you'll really pay attention to this message because it's very applicable, important. And, and, and the person I want to look at is a guy you've probably heard of before. We find him in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 13. And let me introduce you to him. Judges chapter 13, verse 24. Here's what the Bible says about this, this individual. It says, the woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. You ever heard of Samson? You know, God's Hercules. And the Bible says that as he grew, God blessed him. Now, what do we know about Samson? Well, he came from a good family. He came from a godly family. His parents literally prayed over him and dedicated him to God before he was even born. And they raised him as a very special young man, as a Nazarite which means that God had a very special calling and a very special plan for his life. And they raised him to follow God. He had a marvelous future. He was a gifted guy. I mean, he was good looking. He had amazing strength. He had a great personality. People loved being around Samson. He had unlimited potential. He had a great future ahead of him. And all he had to do was to make the right choices, responsible choices and he would have had God's blessings on his life all of his life. Unfortunately, Samson wanted freedom, but he didn't want responsibility. And so Samson ended up making a lot of bad choices, and choices always have consequences, whether they're good or whether they're bad. So let me share with you some lessons that we learn from the choices and the freedom to choose that Samson had and some of the mistakes that he made. First of all, the, one of the lessons we learned from Samson is it's dangerous, it's perilous to have a strong body and a weak will. Now, good looks, physical beauty, strength, wealth, popularity, those are things that most everybody wants today, especially young people. But they are not signs of character. Samson had the potential for an awesome future if he would just make the right choices. He had everything going for him. He had a mother and a dad, especially, that had dedicated to God. And they prayed for him, raised him right, and prayed for him literally every day. I mean, he had everything going for him, especially in high school. He attended Jerusalem High School. He was the quarterback for the Israeli Bulldogs. He was elected the homecoming king. He was voted most likely to succeed in his class. 
I mean, he had a great future. When everybody looked at Samson, they said, man, he's going places. Everything was going great until he started making irresponsible, bad choices. You know, Samson lived in Israel. He was a Hebrew, which means he, he had a special relationship, a special blessing from God because of that. He was considered God's people. But he had a weakness, <laughs> a weakness that many men have, and that was women, but not just any women, the wrong kind of women. You know, he, he should have chosen Hebrew women, women that loved God and served God, but instead he, he liked party girls. So he would go down to a place called Timnah, down in Philistine, to date some of the girls down there. And he ended up dating this, this non-Hebrew Philistine girl and ended up marrying her. One day as he was going down to visit her, the Bible tells this unusual story of how he literally had an encounter with a lion. This lion just comes out of the brush and charges him. And, and he literally takes that lion and kills him with his bare hands and he leaves his carcass there. And what's significant about that is several weeks later, he's going back over to visit his girlfriend again. And there's that carcass that, uh, you know, most of it's been devoured. But inside this empty carcass now, these honeybees have swarmed and made honey and he even dipped some of the honey out and later on gives it to his parents. And what's significant about that is that he, he uses that to put together a riddle. You know, Samson was not only strong, he was extremely intelligent. One of the things that he loved to do that ended up getting him in trouble repeatedly was that he, he loved to play jokes on the Philistines. One of the things he would do, he would often give them riddles and intellectual puzzles for them to solve. And one of the things he said, listen, I've got this, this uh, riddle. If you can figure it out, I'm going to give you 30 polo shirts and 30 designer Levi jeans. But if you can't figure it out, then you got to give me those clothes. And so they agreed. And so he said, here's the riddle. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And what he was talking about was that that eater the, was the lion and the honeybees had gotten inside of him. That's where honey had come. And unfortunately, you know, the Philistines couldn't figure it out. So they said, man, we, we got to figure this out. You know, the deadline's right ahead of us a few days out here. We, we need to figure this out, you know, because <laughs> we, can't, we can't afford to give him all those clothes. And so uh, they get with his girlfriend. And begin to put pressure on her. Matter of fact, it says, if you don't get the answer from him, the consequences for you and your family are going to be really, really, really bad. And so finally she gets with Samson. She says, oh, Samson, you, if you love me, if you really cared about me, you, you, you'll tell me what the middle is. I mean, you, you know this and you haven't shared God. If you really love me, you'll share your secrets with me. And finally, you know, she pressures him and he gives in and he tells her what it is, what the answer is to the riddle is. And, of course, she goes and tells her Philistine friends. And they come and they tell Samson the answer to his riddle. And he's just a little bit upset. Uh, matter of fact, he's upset even with his girlfriend. He uses this phrase. I didn't, and I'm using it. But he talks about a girlfriend. He says, you plowed with my heifer. Uh, so he's, now he owes them these 30 changes of garments. So you know what he does? He goes out and he kills 30 Philistine men, strips off their clothes, and then he brings them and he pays them with clothes from their friends. You know, uh, one of his weaknesses was women. And he often made bad choices. But another weakness that he had was his attitude, his, his anger. He was, his anger was constantly getting him into trouble. Matter of fact, with the father of his girlfriend, who he ends up marrying, literally gives his wife away to another man in marriage, Samson loses it. He's, he loses control. And guess what he does? He goes out and he catches 300 foxes. How in the world he accomplished that? I don't know, but the Bible says he did. 
he caught 300 foxes and then he took them in pairs and tied their tails together and uh, probably doused them with kerosene or whatever. And he sets their tails on fire and then he looses, puts them loose in all of the Philistines' vineyards and their crops. And guess what? They lose everything. Uh, and when that happened, the Philistines were just a little bit upset about that. But that was things he was constantly doing because of his angry you know, by. And so they're out to get, to get Samson now. Matter of fact, they issue a warrant for his arrest. And by nightfall, his picture was in every Philistine post office. It's posted all over social media. He's a wanted man. And so they send out this posse with arrest warrants to arrest him. They catch him. They tie him up. And there he is. They're laughing at him. They're making fun of him. But not only him, but the God that he says he serves and loves. And so finally, he's, he does what we often do when we get ourselves in a bind. He prays, God, get me out of this mess, God. If you'll just give me the strength to defeat my enemies. And he breaks these cords that has him bound. And he literally picks up what happens to be conveniently located by, the Bible says, the jawbone of a donkey. And he takes that jawbone and he literally kills a thousand men in a short amount of time in a conflict with that jawbone. And they call, call the name of that place Jawbone Hill in the future. But that's because, once again, his anger just constantly caused him to lose control. I mean, he's a strong guy physically, but when it comes to his will, he's very weak. And another thing he couldn't control was his sex drive. You know, he uh, finally experiences his ultimate downfall when he decides to start dating a prostitute by the name of, oh, you know the story, Delilah. Did you know everybody has a weakness? Some of us have more than one. And you, we are only as strong as the weakest link in our armor. And guess who knows what your weaknesses are? Satan does. And he'll always do everything he can to exploit your weaknesses. And here's Samson, you know, he thinks he's invincible. You know, and so do the people that knew Samson. Everybody looks on the outside, they see his muscles, his strength, and they think he's invincible. But what they could not see was inside. On the inside, Samson was weak and vulnerable. And that's why it's dangerous to have a strong body, but a weak will. Get it? There's a second lesson we learned from Samson's mistake. And number two is that it's risky to make friends with God's enemies. The Philistines were God's enemies. And that's who he loved to party with. I mean, he loved to party with the Philistines, and he loved to taunt the Philistines. And that's one of the reasons that I believe he loved Philistine women. You know, he would date their women, and he taunted them by taking their women away from them. I mean, he'd go down to the beach, and he'd flex his muscles, and the girls would go, ooh, what a stud you are. But the truth is, he wasn't nearly as strong as they thought he was. See, he shouldn't have been dating Philistine women in the first place. Certainly not prostitutes and harlots, the Bible says. Unfortunately, he made a choice. And it was an irresponsible choice. It was the wrong kind of friends that he chose. And, you know, friends are always a choice. It's one of the most important choices that you as young people will make in your life is who your friends are. Let me share with you some characteristic of the wrong kind of friends. Number one, if you're a Christian, the wrong kind of friends are friends that place an emphasis on temporal values. In other words, the friends that Samson liked were the ones that liked to party and, and uh, drink and 
and today do drugs and smoke pot and do all of those kind of things. You know, the wrong kind of friends not only place an emphasis on immoral values, but number two, they will scoff. They will make fun of spiritual things. For example, if you, if you have friends that you can't talk to about your faith and about Jesus, you may have the wrong kind of friends. And then the third thing with wrong friends is that the wrong kind of friends see no problem with indulging themselves in worldly play. In other words, if it feels good, it's okay. Just do it. And so here Samson is constantly going to the wrong places with the wrong people, and the results are he constantly makes the wrong choices. So do you want to have the best in friendship? Let me offer you three simple suggestions. If you want to have the best in friendship as a Christian, you need to make Jesus your best friend, your number one friend. Commit your heart and your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to be my best friend of all. Number two, if you want to have the best in friendship, never compromise your commitment, your friendship to your best friend, Jesus. And then the third thing is that if you are asked to compromise your commitment to Jesus, and you will, especially as you go through high school, college, you can count on it. You'll be asked to compromise your commitment. What you need to do if you're a Christian is you need to sh verbally share your commitment and your convictions with them. You know, you need to let your friends know that you're a Christian. That doesn't mean you got to act weird or you got to act dumb or silly. You just need to say to your friends, if your friends are tempting you to do something wrong, make a wrong choice, go in the wrong direction, do the wrong thing, you say to them, the reason I can't do that it's because I've committed my life to Jesus Christ, and I don't want to do anything that would hurt my relationship with him. Get it? Well, Samson forgot that. You know, when he met Delilah, he began this relationship that God certainly was not blessing. And, and Delilah begins to pressure Samson to tell her where his strength comes from. Now, she was being pressured. She was being offered money. So she, so she certainly had the wrong kind of values. But anyway, uh, she's pressuring him. And, and you know what Samson never does? He never looks at her and says, until it's too late, Delilah, I have a covenant with God. I can't cut my hair because I'm a Nazarite. And I have this long hair because it represents my covenant, my commitment to God. He never does that. That's why it's so important when your friends try to get you to compromise your values. That's why you need to speak up and share in a gracious way. I can't do that because I'm a Christian. There's a third lesson we learn. Not only is it risky to have the wrong kind of friends, but thirdly, it's dangerous to play with sin. Samson was constantly going to the wrong places, associating with the wrong kind of friends, making the wrong choices, engaging in the wrong kind of entertainment. And finally, here he is with his head in the lap of this beautiful mistress called Delilah. And she's running her fingers through his hair. And she said, oh, Samson, honey, Where'd you get them big old muscles from? You can tell little old Delilah. Uh, and, 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 and then he starts making up stuff. And he plays along with these. He said, well, you know, if you tie me up with seven raw leather cords. And then she says, well, you know, the Philistines are upon. And then he breaks those. Then he said, well, if you dry, tie me up with new ropes that have never been used. And then she says, you know, the Philistines are coming once again, and once again, he jumps up, breaks those. Then she says, if you'll just weave my hair, put curves in my hair, uh, then I'll be like any other man. I'll lose my strength. That doesn't. Isn't it interesting? Every lie that he's telling gets a little closer to the truth. That's the thing about wrong choices and lies never lead to freedom. They ultimately lead to bondage. 
And so finally his will is getting weaker and weaker. And finally Delilah says, oh, Samson, you don't love me. If you really love me, you would tell me the truth. Oh, boo -hoo 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 -hoo. And finally his will breaks down. And he shares with her the source of his strength. He says, it's in my hair. But my hair represents this covenant that I have with God as a Nazarite from the day I was born. And then you know what she does? She helps him. You'd think he would learn, wouldn't you? I mean, every time, you know, she set him up, and here she's finally got him, and he tells her the truth. You know, there's a lesson that we seem to never learn. And the lesson is, is that every generation thinks they can handle the same sins and the same temptations that destroyed the generation before them. And it's like we never seem to learn that lesson. That's Samson. He just forgets that his choices are going to have serious consequences. And so she helps him fall asleep. I'm sure she gives him a lot of wine. And she comes in and has his head shaved. And I don't believe he lost his strength because he lost his hair. I believe he lost his strength because he ignored God's directions. It was because he took his relationship with God and this vow that he made, this covenant, he took that for granted. And we know the story, how the Philistines come in and his strength is gone. He thought he was going to jump up just like he had before and fight all these guys off. But this time they come in, they put him in chains. They gouge out his eyes. Choices always have consequences. For the next 20 years, they prayed Samson around the town. They put him to doing things that either an animal or the lowest of the low would do. They bring him into the Colosseum there just so they can make sport of him and make fun of him. Until finally, his hair's grown back, and he's, boy, he's, he's repentant. He begins to pray, oh, God, forgive me. Which brings us to the last lesson today. And that is when we do sin, God forgives us. God is an amazing God. He never gives up. We, we give up on him, but he never gives up on us. Finally, here Samson is. He's in the Colosseum. They're making fun of him. His eyesight is gone. He's been in chains for years now, being made fun of and sport of. And what's really bad is that they say, our God, the God Dagog, defeated the God of the Israelites, Jehovah God. And so here Samson is once again praying a prayer that he should have prayed long before that. And that was, God, forgive me. God, I have sinned. God, I've made the wrong choices. Does God forgive him? He said, God, would you give me my strength back one more time? And he knocks down the pillars of this temple that he's in, and thousands, over 3,000 people are killed at one time. And he dies too. You see, repentance is something that brings God's forgiveness but repentance doesn't deliver us from the consequences of our choices it's just like here's a teenager who decides I'm going to drink because I'm free to drink I can drink if I want to and so they drink and then one night one night they get in a car and they're drinking and under the influence of alcohol they run a red light they run into somebody and they kill somebody and they survived. I'm sharing that story because I've been down that road with kids before. Literally. Will God forgive that teenager for getting drunk? Will God forgive that teenager for causing the death of somebody else? Will God forgive that? Absolutely. If you're truly repentant, truly remorseful, God will forgive any sin. Will that bring that person back that died? Won't change that consequence. And that's the thing about choices. Choices always have consequences. Consequences that sometimes cannot be changed. So what do we learn from all of this? Well, 
Freedom isn't free. You have to make a choice. Am I going to serve God? Am I going to make the right choices? Am I going to live a life that honors God? Are you going to choose God, choose Jesus Christ, choose to follow Him? I promise you, He'll bless you. Don't listen to those voices that say, well, you know, you know, being a Christian, you won't have any fun. You know, I gave my life to Jesus Christ to serve Him with all of my heart when I was 14. And my life has been a ride. It has been exciting. It, the most exciting and wonderful things that have happened to me have been as I have made the right choices along. I haven't made all the right choices. Starting at the age of 14, when I said, God, I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to do my best to serve you. All of the best things that have ever happened to me have happened as a result of that journey since then of having worked to make good, moral, godly choices. God wants to bless you the same way. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Yes, he will. Let's bow our heads together. Could I encourage you today to make a decision? Lord, I want to follow you, and I want to follow you with all of my heart. I want to make a choice right now, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are. God, I want to put you first because I want your best in my life. I want to experience life to the fullest. And so, God, today I want to make the choice. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And with his help, I'm going to make the best choices, the right choices, choices that would honor God and that would honor me and my body. Would you make that choice right now? If you're going to say, Lord, I want to follow you with all of my heart, and I make the decision today, God, I'm going to do my best to follow you with all of my heart. Would you just raise your hand and let me pray for you? Amen? Amen? Raise it up. Raise it up. Lord, I'm going to follow you. I make the choice today to follow you and to do it with all of my heart. Anyone else? Amen? Amen? How about it, young people? Amen? Amen? Thank you. Put them back down. Anyone else? If you're not a Christian, could I encourage you to take that first step, make that first choice today. Lord, I receive you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. He will hear that prayer. He'll answer it. Heavenly Father, today I, I pray that as we've talked about freedom and making the right choices, God, I pray that no matter how young we are, no matter how old we are, God, I pray that we would make the choice today to follow Jesus Christ with all of our heart, to follow your directions, knowing, God, that you have promised to bless us, to bless us richly, to give us a great future when we follow you. So, God, help us all to do that. And, Lord, maybe there's some of us today that uh, are older that have kind of gotten off track. I pray today, God, that we would do what Samson did. It's never too late. Help us to pray and get back on track to make the decision to follow Jesus Christ today with all of our heart. Lord, I pray for those who lifted their hands, the young and the old alike. God, bless them richly. Help every one of us here today, especially those who made this fresh commitment to follow you with our whole heart. And all of God's people said...